I'm Peter Garrard, and I work here at St George's in the uh, Neuroscience Research Centre. Um, I run the Dementia Research Centre. Uh, it's somewhat arbitrary, but we think of young onset dementia as being dementia in, within working that occurs within working age, where symptoms occur within working age, so under the age of 65. That's a somewhat arbitrary definition. Um, and actually what the statistics show us demographically um, is that the uh, incidence and prevalence of dementia um, is, is very low um, as the, uh, in, in this uh, working age, uh, age group, so less than 1% of the population. Um, and then as the, um, as the population, uh, as, as, the, um, as people age, the incidence increases by about 5% uh, per year. So that over the age of 90, it's estimated that around a quarter or maybe even a third of people meet criteria for dementia. But the importance of this is that, um, is that, that, that it is a disease of aging, if you like. It's a disease for which aging is one of the major um, risk factors. Um, so when, when we see a patient um, or when anyone sees a patient, if in, in general practice, somebody comes along with symptoms that are suggestive uh, of um, cognitive failure, so memory impairment, language loss, behavior change, uh, an ability to navigate or, um, or, or use a vis visual apparatus to perform the tasks of daily life. Um, it's always quite a low, regarded as a, a sort of low probability that there's going, they're going to have anything seriously wrong with them. Whereas in an older person, because the prior probability to use the sort of Bayesian approach is so high, um, those people will be, uh, will, the, the, a diagnosis of dementia will be suspected much, much more often. So there's often a delay. Um, but the, and I think the, the most important biomarkers, if you like, to look out for in a, at, a, at a clinical level are the, um, the, uh, the, the characteristic symptom, com uh, the characteristic symptom complexes, the characteristic symptom areas, and to realize that Dementia doesn't always present with memory problems. It doesn't always pre present with forgetfulness. It, pre it pre can present with difficulty in navigation, difficulty with using visual um, information, so difficulty with reading, with driving, with navigating around the house. Um, and this is quite frequently just dismissed as being uh, a, a, a symptom of visual impairment, which it isn't, it's visual processing impairment. So that must never, that must always be taken seriously. And then there are language symptoms, uh, changes in word finding ability, changes in ability to understand more complex words. And then there are these rather unusual sort of behavioral symptoms where people's personalities change from being compatible with um, leading a normal life in uh, social and work environments with uh, beginning to uh, exhibit bizarre behaviors. With regard to the underlying mechanism of these uh, these these conditions, um, there are um, we think of them in terms of the underlying pathology, uh, and overall the un commonest underlying pathology um, causing dementia is going to be Alzheimer's disease. Um, but overall, and in a younger onset population, those patients with the underlying pathology of Alzheimer's disease would account for maybe a third of the uh, of the population. And, and of the remainder, um, a large percentage uh, would probably be caused by premature vascular disease, uh, and then uh, and then perhaps an equally large percentage uh, with um, with with non-Alzheimer neurodegenerative conditions. There's also in there that um, groups of patients with 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 non-neurodegenerative conditions, inflammatory conditions, um, toxic conditions, alcoholism, all present in that age group with cognitive decline. But the non-Alzheimer neurodegenerative conditions fall into two sort of distinct subtypes. Um, so, and, and they're defined according to the protein that accumulates in the brain. Um, 
So with Alzheimer's disease, of course, as everyone knows, it's amyloid and tau plaques and tangles. And in the non-neurodegenerative, sorry, in the non-Alzheimer neurodegenerative cases, there's one group where tau alone without amyloid is, accumulates, and we call those the tauopathies. And there's um, another group more recently defined where the accumulating abnormal protein uh, is um, something known as TDP43, um, which is, uh, stands for tar DNA binding protein with uh, 43 kilodaltons in length. Um, and tau and TDP43 both accumulate in principally in frontal and temporal regions, so they're sort of front-of-brain neurodegenerative syndromes, whereas Alzheimer's is more posterior. So with Alzheimer's, we see more kind of visual and memory problems, and with the anterior ones, we see more language and behavior problems. Now, um, the, the mechanisms in the vast majority of all these instant, all, all these underlying pathologies are, are unknown, but, as, uh, but a um, proportion of them uh, will be accounted for by having inherited a faulty gene, which are normally and uh, autosomally dominantly transmitted. So they, those ones will be recognized because they will give a very reliable and, and good family history, both in their own generation uh, and in, uh, in their parents' generation, and possibly further back too. Uh, but those only account for about 5 to 10 percent, probably, um, of the of the young of all the young onset dementias, perhaps perhaps slightly more in the non Alzheimer group, uh, but but by far the majority uh, are sporadic, and the causes of sporadic neurodegenerative syndromes are totally unknown, uh, and it, it they are a source of uh, intensive research across the world, and uh, the first person who uh, finds out a mechanism for sporadic Alzheimer's or tauopathy or TDP43 will become very famous indeed very quickly. I think treat, treatment and prevention are should be regarded as, as separate as indeed they are in, um, in cardiovascular disease. Um, though the risk factors for um, for neurodegenerative disease are, are perhaps less well defined than they are than they have been uh, in cerebrovascular disease. Certainly, hypertension, smoking, alcohol excess uh, do lower one's resistance to the development of neurodegenerative diseases as one ages. Um, uh, and and similarly, um, obesity, diabetes, um, lack of physical exercise are also risk factors. So one can do a lot of good by these kind of public health measures, but one will, will not eliminate the incidence of, um, uh, of Alzheimer's disease and the non-Alzheimer degenerative conditions, either in the young onset group or, or, or later in life, simply by, um, even if you, if you educated the entire population with these um, measures. Um, it, it's also... Um, it, there's very good evidence that um, homocysteine uh, is a potent risk factor for the development of Alzheimer pathology. I know that in cerebrovascular disease and uh, coronary vascular disease, there was a uh, there was at one time a, um, a lot of interest in uh, whether we could prevent the incidence by lowering homocysteine, um, and that that hasn't really uh, proved particularly uh, particularly effective. Uh, whereas the evidence in, in Alzheimer's disease, and it seems to act on, uh, on the accumulation of tau protein in Alzheimer pathology, the evidence is that if you lower the homocysteine in people who have above average levels, uh, then you can stabilize their cognition. So that could be a very useful preventative measure, but it, it, needs, a lot of, it needs a large clinical trial to, um, to, 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 to prove its efficacy and, its, and of course its potential health economic benefits. So, uh, so that I think those are the preventive measures that we can take, um, and um, with regard to treatment, um, there are uh, there there is no proven disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there are a lot of compounds in in trial, and there are a lot of molecular targets because so much now is understood about the molecular basis of all these de degenerative conditions, the Alzheimer amyloid and tau. The, the tauopathies and the TDP43 proteinopathies. Now, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the target in all the Alzheimer trials has been to remove the amyloid, 
um, which has been successful using immunological mechanisms, so uh, immunization against amyloid. And that has uh, uh, been shown to remove the amyloid, but not improve cognition or stabilize cognition, suggesting that by the time you, you've got amyloid in the brain sufficient to um, give you a cognitive problem, then you've missed the boat already. So the the idea now is to to is to treat amyloid. If amyloid is going to be helpful, it's going to be used to treat people who are, are as early as possible in their career, if you like, their Alzheimer's career. So people with with minimal or prodromal Alzheimer's disease to see whether we can get remove the tau and and treat them in that way. And then there, sorry, remove the amyloid uh, and, um, and and stabilize the progression of the condition. And then there are new compounds coming along coming along on stream uh, for um, stopping the uh, chemical change that uh, that makes normal tau into toxic tau um, and those uh, th those um, compounds are also being used not only in amyloid uh, in, not only in Alzheimer's disease but also in the tauopathies the TDP 43 proteinopathies um, as far as I know, there are, there are no compounds in trial, mm -hmm. but there are certainly molecular targets there that, um, that, that will, will probably lead to trials coming on stream in a, the next five years.